Okay, I've had some pretty cool topics to talk about on the podcast so far since since we started earlier this year. But you get that topic where people's ears perk up and go, oh, really? Oh, I've got questions. I am so curious. This week's topic is that topic, neurodiversity. I'll be honest, I did not know a lot about it, but my brain is bigger. And I am excited to uh, introduce you to our guest who has come out as a neurodiverse champion. Stick around and you'll meet him. It's Relationships at Work, the Employee Experience and Workplace Culture podcast. As usual, I'm Russell Lolliker. Hello. Hi. How are you? Good. Great to hear. If you're looking for a really good resource or a place to chat about the employee experience and workplace culture, I invite you to head right on over to the Relationships at Work podcast page on LinkedIn. Sharing episodes, sharing articles, sharing some guest insights right there on the page. And all you have to do is go over to LinkedIn, go up at the very top, see that search bar, type in Relationships at Work podcast, and away you go. I'd absolutely love to have you. As much as I absolutely loved to have my guest today on the podcast, Doug Raybold wrote an article. He wrote an article for his organization basically coming out that he was autistic, that he had Asperger's syndrome, that he was neurodivergent. I've included the articles themselves in the show notes. So if you're curious about what Doug had to say, I highly encourage you to see his bravery and that he came out and was so honest and bold in admitting something that he'd been diagnosed with 20 years earlier. And he fought through his fear about people's expectations and labeling to, to be a champion of neurodiversity. So I'm stoked to have him on the show today to talk about that, his experience and what you really need to think about when it comes to neurodiversity and its benefit to your organization, because we're talking about diversity. And if you're not including neurodiverse people and understanding where they're coming from, you're doing your organization a disservice. Doug will tell you all about that in a minute. Here we go. And on the show today, why it's Doug Raybold. And here is why he is awesome. He's a senior manager of customer support at Amwell. He is the chairman of the board of HDI, which named him a top 25 thought leader uh, in IT service and support and customer experience. He is an international speaker, don't you know, and member of the European Customer Experience Organization. And, which is a big reason why he's on the show, besides being all brainy and such, he's recently embraced a role as a neurodivergent leader to bring attention to this area in the workplace as... He is autistic and having been diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, which is a form of autistic spectrum disorder almost 20 years ago. And we're going to talk a bit about how that impacts and how we need to better understand all of neurodivergency in the workplace. Hello, Doug. Hey, Russell. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no, I'm excited to talk to you about this. I mentioned this to a few people that I was going to talk to you today about neurodivergency and I either got oh, that is a really interesting topic, or, oh, I have some questions that I need you to ask him. <laughs> so lots of interest, lots of top of mind, I guess would be the nicest way of putting that, where people are like, this is something I'm either hearing about or know a lot about, and we need to champion this a lot more. So I'm thrilled you're on here. Great. Yeah, it, it's interesting that, that you bring that up, that that it, it piqued curiosity or piqued interest, because I, I've... It's funny, but while I had, you know, sort of a following of, you know, because of my customer experience work and my IT service management work, even my software asset management work, I, I had I had a following of, of people. Um, but it's amazing how many people have, you know, I, I guess the, the level of interest and level of engagement in in my content and the things that that I bring to the table. It, it seems like it's exploded just in the last several months since I, you know, since I made this this great reveal, if you will. Well, it's, it's funny because you're, what you've done is shifted it from professional to personal, even though it's still in the professional world, customer experience, though human and very involved in understanding, but it is connected to sales. It's connected to 
the finance of it all. So that's okay. You can see that that relationship, but once you talk about something that is neurodivergency being something that people have and are not even comfortable talking or revealing about it because of possible stigma, possible judgment, they want to be heard. And to hear somebody like you that's going, you know what, this is something I need to champion. They're immediately going to feel connected and sort of going, I either I want to know more or I have staff that I know there's something there that I need to better understand them with. So I, I not surprised at all that you've touched on something that I think has been long past not touched on. Yeah, agreed. And, you know, I, I kind of threw caution to the wind. And, and it's interesting that that some of my fellow speakers and, and, and thought leaders in, in the area that I'm in have come out and they're like, Doug, this is your th this is your thing going forward. It's like all the other stuff is great and you can weave that in. But this is your story going forward. So uh, very, very, very cool. And, you know, while while I held back on telling this story for 20 years, because of concerns about how it would be received and, you know, what the perception of me may be. Um, it's funny, it's actually had exactly the opposite, you know, of what my, what my fears, trepidations and concerns were. It's had the opposite impact on, on where my career, uh, career trajectory is going. And I've got so many questions on that, Doug, but first I have to ask the question, which is what's your best or worst employee experience? I, I always try to focus on the positive. So, so I'm going to give you the best. So I, I had a first career in sales. I was in sales and sales management for about 18 years before 13 years ago, I moved into IT. And in that first career, uh, one of my career stops was with UPS Freight. When UPS had acquired uh, overnight freight out of Virginia, we, we decided, hey, it would be great to take some of our, our smaller, small package accounts, which is what, you know, the, the typical little brown truck, um, that's the small package group, take some of these smaller, small package accounts and, and try to cross sell freight. And so Doug was put over this program to, you know, outbound calls to, to some of our, our small package accounts and, and try to cross sell freight. Um, and I had a team of, of 13 people that, that were making these calls. And, and our goal for year one was, hey, we want you to generate $1 million in new revenue for freight off of our small package accounts. Well, I put together, I mean, I, I picked and chose the best people, um, brought them onto the team. And, and not only did we more than meet that goal, we, we were generating a million dollars in new revenue per month within the first six months. And so, you know, we, we had 300 people sitting in a call center and, you know, the powers that be were like, hey, you know, if, if you can take 13 people and generate a million dollars in new revenue a month, why don't we have all 200 or 300 people making these calls? I'm like, well, that's great, but what are you going to do with with these people, right? Um, and they're like, well, we'll make them subject matter experts, so th they'll take you know take turnover calls when when the the two or three hundred people can't close the deal. I'm like, well, so what you're doing is you're, you're taking people that are really effective, really efficient at sales, and you're turning them into SMEs, and and taking what they're good at, what they enjoy, away from them. They're like, well, you, when you put it that way, you know, the program has to end. We're going to do this. So what what's your thought? And one of the things that I did is I said, hey, can I take these, you know, anybody that's interested from this 13, can we find field jobs for them? Get them out selling freight in front of the customer, put them in front of the customer instead of on the phone. They said, hey, if you can find them, you know, if you can find the positions for them, do it. Um, so I managed to find of the 13, I managed to find eight positions got eight of those 13 out in front of customers selling freight. Three of them, well, six of them are still doing that. This is, what, 17 years later. Um, and three of them are in executive leadership positions in that industry. So, I mean, like senior directors type thing. So, I, I mean, that to me was the right thing to do. If, if you've got these people that are phenomenal and, and really good at what they do, don't take them out of their comfort zone if they don't want to be. If they want to move into something different, great. Give them the opportunity to put it in front of them, you know, a career path so that they can get there. But if if they're happy and content doing what they're doing, capitalize on that strength. I'm a huge proponent of strength finders. And if, if people are in their wheelhouse, keep them in their wheelhouse. Don't give them something different to do. So that, that's my employee experience. You know, that, that's, I always say that's the thing that I'm most proud of. And it's, it's funny when, when you look at my bio at any conference, it, it asks, 
ask Doug if you have a few minutes what what he's most proud of in his career. That's the story I tell. And it's nice that it's, I mean, I, I love that that's your experience, but how dependent it is it on a culture that will listen to their staff in order for experiences like that to be able to happen? Yeah, a- absolutely. Culture is, is a huge component to that. I, I mean, you know, a large corporation like EPS just should, could have said, hey, Doug, this is what we're doing. What, like it or, you know, like it or leave it. Um, but, you know, to their credit, you know, my, my leadership was was very open and receptive to and, and, and the whole call center thing was new to them, too. So the fact that they even had a call center and then, you know, got somebody else that has call center experience coming in from a different arena and says, hey, there's there's a better way of doing this rather than than just, you know, forcing something on these people. Um, you know, kudos to them for for having that open ear and listening and, and acting on it. Our topic today, neurodiversity, it seems to be quite an umbrella term in that it covers quite a bit, but I'd really like to maybe start by defining what we can before we move forward on getting more into the corners of it. So how would you define neurodiversity or neurodivergent? So great question, Russell, and and I'm glad you asked it that way because there's really two things. So neurodiversity encompasses everyone. That's that's the whole idea behind diversity of any kind, right? There's there's a, a, a full gamut. There, there's everyone includes those who are neurotypical, which is is the terminology. Neurotypical is those who think alike, and then there's the neurodivergent. So neurodiversity encompasses neurotypical and neurodivergent. Neurodivergent encompasses multiple different things. So there's autism spectrum disorder, um, which is which is what my condition is. There's Tourette's, um, there's ADHD. So, and, and, and you know, I, I could probably name a dozen other ones, but most of the ones that, that are in front and center in, in the world today are, are those three. It's ADHD is, is probably the one that gets the most attention. And then autism spectrum disorder. And then uh, finally, Tourette's is probably a, a distant third, but um, there, there's, there's literally like over a dozen different neurodiverse, uh, neurodivergent classifications. Um, and one of the things that I've found, and, and it's funny because as, as I've sort of embraced this, you know, and frankly, this, this didn't just happen overnight. Doug didn't just say, you know, wake up one morning and say, you know what, I think I'm going to come out to the world that I'm neurodivergent. Um, it was a process of, you know, I, I probably planned this whole thing out for about three years saying, should I, shouldn't I going back and forth. But Part of, of that process was educating myself about what I had. It's one thing to get a diagnosis. It's another thing to educate yourself. And, and I spent a couple of years actually educating myself so that if and when the day came that, that I did decide to reveal that, you know, that scenario to the world, that I'd be able to speak to it and, and help people understand. And what's truly interesting is, is when people hear about autism, they think about the, the nonverbal autists. Um, while that is is one of the highest percentage of folks with autism spectrum disorder, it is certainly not a majority even. It just happens to be the most visible. And that's one of the interesting things about autism spectrum disorder is it's called a hidden disability because there are a lot of people out there that while they may you know, there, there may be some interesting things about them that may be intriguing or that that may you know, somebody may go, well, they're, they're a little strange or, or, you know, they have problems communicating. Um, but you don't think that they may be afflicted with a condition like autism spectrum disorder. They just seem a little different. And, and you know, I would say that's probably the category that I fell in. Um, fortunately, I spent many years um, being, you know, I, I guess in a sense, what they call masking, hiding that, finding ways to, to cope with what was going on inside me. Um, so that it didn't present itself externally. Um, and, and, you know, that, that's become sort of part of me. Um, I'm now to that point, having, having made my big reveal, that I'm okay if, if, you know, when there's a lot of noise going on around me, I got to shrink away. I got to find a place to, to decompress, if, even if it's just 10, 15 minutes. And I, it used to be I'd just disappear. Now I'm like, hey, folks, this is a little much right now. I, I got to step away. And, and, you know, now I'm comfortable saying that, but in the past I wouldn't have been, I just would have disappeared and people would have been like, 
where's Doug? You know, <laughs> where'd Doug go? What's possibly a misunderstanding about neurodivergency? Is there certain things that people are like, oh, that falls under, but it, it doesn't? There's a lot of things misunderstood about neurodivergency. You know, and I mentioned one of them. People think uh, typically of autism just as as the person that, you know, is, is in a wheelchair and, and non-communicative. But th there are a lot of leaders out there that, that have self-identified recently as neurodivergent. Um, Elon Musk recently. Um, uh, Sir Richard Branson. Uh, I mean, there's there's a lot of business leaders now that are uh, you know having that moment of clarity and and saying, I, I've been like this all my life, and and yet I've been successful. So it's it's not necessarily a negative, and, and I think that's probably the, the the biggest misconception is that if you have something like autism or or even Tourette's, you, you're you're probably not going to be successful, and and maybe you cannot lead. Um, and, you know, that, that kind of dovetails into into our conversation today, I'm sure. You know, I've been very successful as a leader and, and it's it's you know, I wouldn't even say it's necessarily despite the fact that I have ASD. In some cases, it's because I do. And, and I've learned how to be a very effective leader by leveraging, you know, I, I hate the term superpowers, but that kind of gets thrown around leveraging my condition, um, leveraging certain aspects of my condition to make me a more effective leader. As someone with Asperger's and going to work, maybe take us back before you revealed it to everybody what you had, what was different from you that others may not understand that being in the workplace, having a neurodivergent uh, condition, you know, I'm just trying to look at your examples of how you would look at the workplace differently than somebody else might just to raise some awareness about it. Sure. Yeah. So Russell, one, one of the things that, that I found early in my career and, and, you know, I, I am, I am afflicted with the, the lack of natural empathy, um, which is, which is fairly typical, fairly common among a, uh, autism, you know, those, those with autism. And so one of the things that I found early on is, is I had a very directive, very bull in the China shop approach to, to leadership and, and, that didn't serve me well. It certainly didn't serve the people that reported to me well. And so one of the things that, that I discovered is I had to stop and think before I say something, what can I expect the result to be from what I want to say versus what I should say and versus how I should say it? Um, because my natural inclination is just to be very like, like just say it you know, just blurt it out, get it out of the way, you know, and, and, and then let's move on. Um, but that doesn't always work well when you're leading people because they, they, you know, different people are motivated by different things. And so what I found myself doing and what I do to this day to a lesser degree, because now, now it's sort of, I've gotten it hardwired, but over the course of my career as a leader, one of the things that I found myself ha having to do is is gauge people's reactions to certain ways that I would say things or things that I would say, and then, you know, sort of catalog that away. And in the future, when I need to say something or or re you know say say something, do something, rely on that experience to gauge how or, you know to to really formulate how I'll I'll present it the next time. And so I, you know, I sort of build up this repository of experiences that I, you know, go through whenever I'm, whenever I'm talking to people, um, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or even in, particularly in group leadership uh, situations, is before I speak, going through that catalog in my mind very rapidly to, you know, to make sure that I say things the way that I think will be received in the way that I intend them to, not the way that a neurotypical person may perceive them if they're not, you know, couched in the right language or, or with the proper sentiment. Why should organizations embrace neurodiversity as something that they should understand better and, and look for people in leadership roles to embrace this different way of thinking? Well, so when, when using the term neurodiversity, diversity of any kind, it, it should be embraced. I, I mean, that's just the reality. Whenever we fail to have a diverse workforce, a diverse team of any kind, 
uh, what you do is you you give yourself blind spots. That there's always going to be an element that's missing, and you know I I go back to you know some some of the leadership positions I've had. One of the first things I do is look around the table and see do we have underrepresented individuals on this you know on this team? If we don't, we need some. Um, bring some on. There were often cases where, you know, I, I didn't have to ask, do we have neurodivergent on, the, you know, on this team? Because I knew we did. <laughs> so, but, you know, I, I think it's critical that as more and more people and, you know, the, the statistics show that up, upwards of 10% of the population probably has some sort of neurodivergency. So if, if you're leaving out 10% of your customers, 10% of your employees, you know, obviously there's going to be a gap and, and somewhere along the way, um, there's going to be a failure. And, and so diversity of any kind is absolutely to be embraced uh, on any kind of team, any kind of leadership that, uh, that, that you're involved in. Um, you know, it's, it's not just neurodivergency, it's, it's divergency of all, or uh, diversity of all kinds, you know, race, creed, religion, um, gender, and even looking at, at non-traditional genders, non-binaries, making sure that, that you are, every team is capturing every sort of diversity out there. Again, using you as an example, and you were kind of mentioning the quote unquote term you hate to use, superpowers. <laughs> what are you using for your own neurodivergency that you think is benefiting the organization and your own leadership in, in the way you think? Yeah. So, you know, I'll, I'll use the term I don't like. So, so one of my superpowers, if you will, is just absolutely finding the, these areas of interest and, and immersing myself completely and totally in them for, for sometimes it's weeks, sometimes it's months, sometimes it's years. You know, I'll, I'll throw out just a, a stupid example here. Um, there was a, a period in time when I was in college and, and, all my buddies and I played Dungeons and Dragons. And I got to where, I mean, I knew how to create these broken characters that, because I knew the rules inside and out, I understood all the mechanics of the game. And, and it's just like, I could create these broken characters that were just undefeatable. And, and you know, that, that sort of thing, I, I spent months learning those mechanics. And, and then, you know, then, then it was time to move on to something different. And, and that's something that I've done throughout my life. I'll, I'll find something, latch on to something that I absolutely am, you know, kind of obsessive about and, and learn everything about it. And then I'm ready to move on to something new. Case in point, I had five different majors in college because I, I'd get into a major, I'd fall in love with it. I'd learn everything I could. I'd sh show myself to be an A plus student in it. And then I'd be like, oh, I've kind of done everything I can do here. Let's move on to something nothing, into something new. Um, eventually, my parents said, you got to figure out a way to, to finish one of these up. But, you know, that what that's done for me, and, and, you know, I sort of reference that I have this experiential repository in my mind. I also have this, this catalog of facts and data and, and, you know, really strange topics that, that don't seem in any way related to what I do, service management or, or customer experience. But in point of fact, what I do is, is I, I actually hearken back through that catalog of things that I've done and things that I've known in the past in order to come up with really strange, unique and, and outside the box ways of doing things. It's funny. And, and I'll throw out like philosophy quotes when, when I'm composing an email and, and people just, kind of eat it up. I mean, they're like, Hey, you know, that's, that's really cool. People, people in our business don't really think that way usually. So, so getting people, you know, get, getting the employees and the teams to think of things in a different way and, and not just think in the silos of, of you know, I, and, and I always say, I'm not an IT lifer. I've only been in it 13 years after a prior career. Um, and, and that, ability to to think outside the box i think has served me my teams and, and my companies and my clients very well as i've been doing this podcast i just keep hearing and seeing this connection between innovation and diversity which most organizations will talk about innovation and drop it like a buzzword but they don't see the connection that if you want innovation you have to embrace people that, that think differently, that are not the norm that you might be, you know, comfortable with. 
So that begs the question, Doug, why is this so hard for organizations to more embrace uh, in the workplace? Yeah, so so excellent question. And, and you know, I, I always say I'm, I'm a disruptor by nature. I mean, that that to me is is just I was born to be a consultant and born to be a, a disruptor. I already referenced um, strengths finders and, and my top three top three strengths are learner, arranger and futurist. So it's like, I mean, to me, that just says, Doug, you were you were born to like go in, learn everything about something, figure out what how it should be versus how it is today and then put it there and then move on to the next thing. Right. And so you're right. There's there's that innovation aspect and and there's that disruption aspect. And I think some of the organizations out there that talk about innovation but don't really embrace it, it's because there there is sort of that status quo mentality that I, I sort of referenced in in my last response. People learn things one way; they they learn things somewhat lin- in a linear fashion, and they learn from people who have always done it one way, and so it's just sort of this continuity. Disruption is exactly the opposite. Disruption is, okay, I get how it's been done, but is that really the best way to do it now? You know, particularly in the world I live in, in IT service management and customer experience, those things evolve in the marketplace constantly. I mean, not just evolutionary change. Some cases it's revolutionary change. What was good in, you know, January of 2020, in March of 2020, was no longer considered to be good. You know, things just changed overnight because everybody went from working in an office or the majority went from working in an office to working from home. And you had to figure out new, better, different ways of doing things. And so those who were accustomed to doing it one way didn't really embrace that very well and and didn't really succeed very well. It's those who were, were willing, able, and capable of disrupting and looking at things this other way that, that really thrived in that environment. Um, which I find very interesting because now some of these same organizations are starting to move people back and forcing people to move back into the office. And so, you know, it's it's kind of that ebb and flow of innovation's great as long as I need you to innovate. But when I don't want you to innovate any any longer, I want you to back on my campus type thing. There's absolutely that that disruptive component to innovation and, and organizations that are are going to be future leaders are the ones who truly embrace innovation as opposed to just speaking about it. I've read as well that one of the most substantial challenges to neurodivergent acceptance in the workplace is that people don't view cognitive differences as, say, a disability. What are your thoughts on that? I mentioned, Russell, earlier that ASD is is what's known as a hidden disability, and, and that's because, you know, I... I I quote unquote passed for 20 years of, of just being Doug, you know, <laughs> it's Doug is Doug. Um, but it's funny because when people do make that reveal, suddenly, you know, and, and actually the way that I did this reveal was through an article that I wrote for HDI. And um, and in that article, I, I you know, I, I kind of referenced that some people may, when they read this, be like, oh, well, now Doug makes a little more sense because he, he's had these little quirks that, you know, we thought it was just, he was just a little odd, um, but that ultimately I'm still just who I am a- and I'm no more nor less, no different than I was, you know, a, a week ago, a month ago, six months ago, a year ago, or even 20 years ago when I was first diagnosed. Um, so so ultimately the, the idea is don't look at people as a label, look at people as what their capabilities are. Yeah, I mean, that, that's how we should be evaluating people is what their strengths, capabilities, and, and abilities are. Not, are they neurodivergent? Are they black, white, Hispanic? I mean, none, none of this is important. What's important is, do they add value to the organization and to the team? Do you think hiring practices are a problem for this? You, you know, it's it's interesting you ask that, Russell. And, um, you know, there's there's thoughts on both sides of this. Um, so I, I don't have the, the key to the the key answer to this question for you, but but I, I will give you some insight. Personally speaking, I wouldn't put on an application that I am that I have a disability. What I do is is I 
I would put decline to answer. I do the same for every one of those. And, and the reason I, I would do that is because, you know, and, and there's, there's the questions of, you know, are, are you a veteran? Are you disabled? Um, you know, all, all these different protected classes. Um, and the reason I would do that is some organizations may give you preferential treatment. Others may, you know, put that, put that resume to the, to the bottom of the pile. Um, I think as someone who is neurodivergent, I don't want either of those. I don't want preferential treatment and I don't want to be, you know, singled out as, as a poor candidate. I want to be evaluated on my merit, the value that I bring. Um, so, you know, how an organization, you know, determines if they do or do not want to hire neurodivergent, I, I, to me, I could care less. Um, and, and I would hope that everyone that is in any, you know, underrepresented class would, would feel the same way. You want to be evaluated on your merit, not on what underrepresented class you're part of. So as an employer, and you're, you, you have all the power here, Doug, as an employer, how can they better embrace neurodiversity in the workplace? Because we know everybody likes a to-do list, but I know this is much about mind shift. It is about um, tactics they can take. So what are some actionables? that people can start looking at either uh, start looking to the future or things they can do now? Yeah. And, and that's a, another great question, Russell, you know, when I look at, and, and I've, you know, I went and got a certification through Uni university of South Florida, which I recommend to anybody. It is a free certification on diversity, equity, and inclusion. They run it a couple of times a year. One of the challenges with any diversity program is that, it often winds up being a check the box exercise. And, and it's just, do we have a program in place? Are we doing our best? Um, do we educate our, our, our leaders and our employees on what diversity, equity, and inclusive and, and inclusion is? Um, and then move on. And oh, by the way, you know, for whatever month it happens to be, uh, whether it's Black History Month or Autistic Awareness Month, whatever, whatever month it is, do we celebrate that in some form or fashion? Um, and, and that's a start. But I don't think it's really culture changing. I, I, there's a difference between awareness and acceptance. And I think most of the DEI programs that I've seen, at, and I've, I've worked for major corporations, multiple Fortune 500 companies, and most of the DEI programs I've seen are awareness campaigns which again is a good start, but that's all it is. Acceptance means it, it goes beyond that. It's we embrace a, a diverse workforce. You know, we, we understand that, and it goes back to the, the earlier question. We understand that there's a need to have underrepresented classes of workers as part of our staff and as even part of our leadership because they bring a different perspective and they help us to avoid those blind spots. I don't see much of that happening. And, and I, if, you know, if I could wave my magic wand and, and get my one wish when, when it comes to neurodivergence and neurodiversity, it would be that we move from awareness to acceptance. How has it been in your organization? You came out and told everybody, this is, you know, this is me. This is who I am. How is it embraced in your organization and how have they made it better for you or not? Well, I, I just made the announcement. I made the announcement on LinkedIn. I made it through um, a couple of podcasts that I've been on. Uh, and thank you for having me on, Russell. Um, and, and then through the article that I wrote for um, wrote for the HDI uh, service management world or uh, support world live. Um, I also spoke about it, incorporated that into a couple of the presentations that I did at the at a couple of conferences this year. Um, I didn't make it the topic. I just incorporated it in. But, you know, again, I, I, I didn't wave the flag within my within my day job because that's not what I'm really about. Um, what I'm about is I just want to be authentic of who I am and, and I want to pave the way for others to be authentically who they are. I, I'm not here to be an activist. Uh, that, that's not my intention by any stretch. What, what my intention is, is, is really to pave the way, you know, for, for that 
acceptance and awareness, you know, and, and to me, that's, that, that's what it's all about is, you know, I, I feel like I had to navigate some, some challenging waters for 20 years. And if I can make it a little bit easier, if I can smooth those waters for someone else, uh, that, that at the stage that I'm uh, in my career that I'm at now, if I can do that for someone else, that to me is what's most important. I reached out to my community and asked them to throw me a couple of questions that to pitch your way. And there was one that really stood out to me, which is one person was asking, how do you educate supervisors and managers who may not see neurodiversity or the traits of neurodiversity as real, or they put their own label on it, i.e., oh, you're just lazy. Oh, you can't focus well enough. Oh, just these other traits rather than the reality of the situation. How do you educate those people? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Um, and and the reality with when it comes to any diversity campaign is there there are going to be some people who will not embrace it. Doesn't matter what it is that there are going to be some who are just closed minded. Um, and you know, I I say this with a degree of hesitancy, but I don't waste my energy on people that I, I can't make a difference with. Um, and it's not that I wouldn't be willing to educate somebody that that was closed minded about this. Um, but I also would rather focus my energies on those who are, who are at least willing to listen. Um, and, and, you know, it, it sounds like a non-answer. Um, but, you know, I, I think there's, there's a critical element to knowing when it makes sense to, to put out effort, you know, sort of that risk reward analysis, which is another thing that I do inherently. Um, I always look at risk reward. It's like, is the, is the juice worth the squeeze? Um, and, and, you know, there, there's some cases where the answer to that is no. At the beginning, you did mention that there was a lot of fear from you about being more vulnerable and revealing uh, your neurodiversity. I'm kind of curious about what you were afraid of, but also what ended up happening once you did. Yeah. Um, my concern, and, and I have always had leadership skills. Just I, I've always had this leadership mentality. I've always had people would gravitate toward me. And I don't mean that to sound conceited in any fashion, but I was always sort of this central sphere of influence in whatever group I was in. My concern was 20 years ago when when I you know was diagnosed with Asperger's, it's like if I tell people I've got Asperger's, they're gonna think I can't lead. They're gonna think that, you know, Doug's got this this disease or, you know, whatever, whatever they want to call it, this condition, this disease, because back then in particular, there was very little understanding about neuro, neurodiversity and, and neurodivergence. And, and so my concern was if I come out and, and have this big reveal 20 years ago, uh, I, I kill my leadership career. And, and that's what I've always wanted to be is, is I've always, always wanted to lead people. And I, I always, you know, my, my desire is always to help people improve, get better, you know, get eight people promoted into into sales roles in the field. That's why it's my proudest accomplishment, because I did something to help their careers. And so my biggest concern wasn't about, you know, does it does it shut the door on on Doug and, you know, he'll, he'll always be an individual contributor the rest of his life. It's what is the what is the impact on the people that I could potentially have been helping? So, Doug. What's one simple action people can do right now to improve their relationships at work? Right now, what we need is we absolutely need to connect with our peers and with our leaders. And as leaders, we need to connect with our entire team. One of the challenges, um, one thing I will, will say is that there has been a bit of fragmentation around connection between teams uh, as everybody's worked from home. And that's not because it's not possible. It's because there hasn't been enough effort put forth to keep people connected. I think early on in the pandemic, there was that connection element of, you know, open office hours, you know, a leader would have, you know, water cooler time on a Friday afternoon, the virtual water cooler, if you will. Um, but a lot of that, as we became more productive at working from home, a lot of that started falling by the wayside. Um, and, and so I would say that's one of the elements that we need to recapture is, is connectedness. That's Doug Raybold. He's the senior manager of customer support at Amwell, but also he is 
a neurodivergent leader trying to bring attention to a very important topic through his own experience and through the getting the awareness of others. Thanks so much for being here, Doug. Thanks, Russell. Appreciate it.